actually jump in to the State of Dragonflies report and its findings, I thought it would be useful to set out um, by way of background exactly what we can record and why we might record it. So um, we can, for example, look at larvae. Um, it's very important really to um, check what's breeding in our ponds and rivers. And um, by doing so, that gives us a measure of site suitability. However, it's a rather specialist area of work and very time consuming. I'm sure many of you will have tried dipping and uh, trying your luck. Um, it's not always easy to identify what you get. Um, some of those damselflies in particular look very similar. And also it's very easy to miss things because you are sampling and not making any form of census of the data. So in the same way, we can also look for exuviae using the same identification criteria. Um, that gives us an even better measure of site productivity because we know exactly what has bred successfully in that site. Um, but most of us, to be honest and fair, are interested in adults and how we might try and um, use the numbers of adults to um, monitor what's going on. So I've used the word monitor there and monitoring. We can divide it into uh, several subdivisions, I suppose. So monitoring activities are based on repeat surveys. So when you go out looking at dragonflies, you're surveying them, you're maybe counting them, uh, you're maybe estimating them, you're maybe um, recording what breeding activity you see. Um, you can also monitor at the site level, and I think that's where perhaps the term is best used. And maybe at a, um, a broader scale, a national scale, when we're interested in what dragonfly or other animal populations are doing, we, um, we are actually interested in surveillance rather than monitoring per se. So some subtle and maybe pedantic um, definitions there. Um, so yeah, there's a picture of some four spotted chasers roosting in a reed bed. Um, they do it occasionally, not very often. Um, and believe me, trying to count or even estimate what's in there is horrendous. Um, Dave Thompson, when he was working at Liverpool University and looking, for example, at Southern damselfly populations, he used the mark recapture methodology for finding out how many there were. And that was clearly a very laborious process. And it was always a little bit, to my mind, um, imperfect because you could never mark them when they first emerged because they were too soft. You had to wait for them to mature. So maybe you missed emigration at emergence. Anyway, coming up with um, numbers of dragonflies is um, always going to be difficult. Yeah, someone's commented that you can see um, in Britain concentrations of four spots like this at Hamwall in the RSPB reserve in the Avalon marshes in Somerset. These were actually photographed at Lake Neusiedl in Austria, where I found them a few times roosting overnight. We can also rather indirectly measure the value of a site and maybe a species overall by looking at the condition of its habitat. That is also fraught with problems. This is a southern damselfly and there's one of its habitats in the new forest at Crockford Stream. And it took two PhDs, so that was a six year period and an awful lot of effort to come up with the indirect, the surrogate measures um, that will tell us what's good or not good for southern damselfly. And ironically, there we are with one of our rarest species, and we know an awful lot more about southern damselfly than we do about probably azure damselfly or even common blue. 
Mm. Okay. So we also have used our records widely as to most biological recorders for producing distribution maps, as in our atlases. There's the emperor dragonfly from our recent atlas. And we can look at, uh, particularly if we do this repeatedly, we can look at changes in distribution. Although here we are at a fairly coarse um, scale for the national picture, we're looking at hectares or 10 kilometer squares. But we can see fairly clearly from that, I hope, those dark upward pointing triangles that tells us uh, that species has invaded those hectares, if you like, over the period since the turn of the millennium. We can also use that course hectare data at a national scale to look at species diversity. So there we can compare the picture up to 1990 with the picture up to 2019. So that's a very up-to-date data set. And you'll see a darkening of colors. And that tells us that, uh, yes, there are more species um, in those squares, doesn't it? Or does it? Does it actually mean there are more people looking these days uh, for those species in those squares? And actually the reality is a bit of both, isn't it? We're seeing species um, spreading and being found as a result, to some extent, of more observer effort. We can also look at range um, and we can do that uh, rather crudely um, by drawing a line around the extreme um, areas occupied by, in this case, the Azure Hawker. Although I believe those maybe down in the south are no longer present. Anyway, enough of that. Um, but the idea is that you, you create um, an area and try and measure that area. So that's one way you can measure the range, perhaps slightly more usefully than just simple numbers of hectares on a map. So speaking of that, we in the last atlas were able to produce some, I think, really very useful statistics showing um, where, in this case, the emperor dragonfly had appeared um, in number terms uh, in each of the um, constituent parts of Britain and Ireland. So the number or maybe percentage of known sites, and in this case, sites of course are 10 kilometer squares, so quite big sites in that respect. So if we look at all of those, I would discount nearly all of them as being of any use for trying to um, undertake dragonfly surveillance. So looking at a national scale at the production of trends, working out what's increasing, what's decreasing. So it's the occupancy down at the bottom that I'm going to be focusing on now. We did try um, 10 or 15 years ago um, to pilot a monitoring scheme using a Dutch methodology, very similar to butterfly transects, um, but we also used point counts. And we had about 50 sites counted at varying frequencies over four years. And um, the Centre for Ecology and Hydrology very kindly looked at our data and basically said what I think we already knew is that we didn't really have enough data. We didn't have enough transects. And with the limited numbers available through dragonfly recorders, we were probably never going to get to the state of getting robust statistics for our dragonflies through that method, through counting dragonflies. However, there was a godsend. Um, Steve Prentice, who some of you may remember, and I were invited to The Hague um, just over 10 years ago for um, a presentation by Arco van Stryen, who's employed by the Dutch um, government. And he had piloted the use of occupancy detection modeling or occupancy modeling as it was known then uh, for um, butterflies and dragonflies. So um, a group of people from around Europe gathered to hear what he had to say and also share our experience of what we were doing to try and monitor um, dragonflies. 
Now that um, methodology was developed further by ARCO and also here by the Center for Ecology and Hydrology. They produced um, the first trends for us for the second atlas and there's been further refinement of the methodology since then. And in fact, it was um, with this updated methodology that they reviewed the records up to 2019. So So we used, instead of 10 kilometer squares, we used monads or one kilometer squares as sites. So um, these are practical in the sense that we have um, a UK national grid divided up into monads and our data, most of our, our records are at six or sometimes four figure grid reference. So we've got that one kilometer accuracy for a lot of records. There is no need to count. So the numbers game is not so important and insects are notoriously difficult to try and put numbers on, fraught with problems. So it is categoric presence or absence data. And it uses the records we've already got, which are gathered mostly in a very ad hoc fashion. And that to be able to um, retrospectively go back in time and look at existing records that were not gathered by any fancy random sampling technique is really a holy grail for coming up with population trends for not just dragonflies, but a whole range of other things too. So occupancy, which is what I'm gonna be talking about here, is a surrogate measure of abundance, and it is defined as the proportion of a geographical area in which each species was present in a year. And the occupancy um, statistic increases when species become more widespread and it decreases when they become less widespread. It's also um, because of the way the modeling works, it measures the probability of species being present in what would be randomly selected squares. So it actually does random sampling as part of the analysis process. So that makes it quite robust statistically. And he gives us two very important products. The first one, I'm going to show you a few of these um, trend graphs. So we get annual occupancy plots. And rather importantly for the statisticians, we get what's known as the credible interval. So that's the gray area on these plots is the 95% credible interval. It also produced changes in occupancy over a 50 year period. So we analyzed all our records from 1970 onwards, and that gave us an awful lot to play with. And there we are, and there's the uh, URL for those who haven't yet looked at it, if you want to download it in detail and read it at your leisure. I should perhaps say that originally this was going to be State of Dragonflies 2020, but a certain pandemic got in the way and uh, things got a little bit delayed. Um, but for quite a long time last year, I was referring to this with my co-authors as SOD20, which was actually um, quite an interesting phrase to use in a pandemic year. Anyway, we were able to analyze 1.4 million records and there are over 17,000 uh, citizen scientists' names against those records. And we, um, at the overall level, were able to show that more than half of our resident and or regular migrant species of dragonfly and damselfly changed significantly, 52%. And that's made up of 41% that increased and 11% that declined significantly in occupancy. So those are the headline figures. I'll come back to those later. So let's have a look at our 46 resident and regular migrants of these that we, were, that we had good data for, 19. So that's our 41% increased, five 
declined. 22 species saw no significant changes, or at least they, they didn't reach statistical significance. Um, in addition, there were five other species increased and three decreased in, in one or sometimes more of the constituent countries, but not overall in Britain and Ireland. So again, an overall picture of increasing species. There's the graph that puts all of them in one picture. The line uh, just below center is the no change line. And on the left-hand side, the emperor dragonfly, its distribution expanded by 0.56, which means 56%. At the other end of the scale, emerald damselfly, which came as a little bit of a surprise to us, was at the bottom of the charts, and that contracted by 14%. So there's our, um, well, it, it's not the top 10 or the top 20, it's um, top 13, because that's what would fit comfortably on the page. Uh, but you can see um, some quite substantial increases there in those species, and they're a mix of um, species that expanded to the north and or to the west. So things like the emperor dragonfly, the migrant hawker. Um, there was infilling, often associated with range expansion around the edges too, but also of course colonization from things like the small red-eyed damselfly, the willow emerald and so on. So let's look at some of these species in a bit more detail. There's the graph for the emperor dragonfly, and I think that's a nice convincing 56% increase over that 50 year period. Um, interesting, interestingly, a 72% increase in the Republic of Ireland. Basically it colonized the coastal um, regions, the south and the east coast of Ireland. Migrant hawker. Um, the next highest increase and a fairly steady increase, though there was um, a bit of a, um, a surge partway through that 50 year period, um, which actually. Sorry, I'm just re 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 reading a comment there, which we can maybe come back to. Um, uh, it does suggest a, a surge in records there, uh, perhaps during the, the 1990s or 80s. Ruddy data increased and again very concertedly over about a 10 year period but there doesn't seem to have been a significant increase apart from very recently um, in that species and it did a lot of its increasing um, more than 30 years ago. At the bottom end of the scale the red and pink species um, there we go, emerald damselfly, black darter and common hawker. So black darter and common hawker species we associate with the north. We've just heard that these occur north of the Arctic Circle. Um, but also small decreases, um, slightly less significant in two of our smallest damselflies. So the emerald damselfly not quite such um, a massive decline as the uh, increase in emperor dragonfly at the other end of the scale, but nevertheless some decline and significantly so. Black data, interestingly more so in Wales and perhaps in Scotland, although the statistic um, was not significant statistically, um, but nevertheless, uh, an overall decline. Andrew Brown's commented about observer effort. And what the modeling does is to attempt to take observer effort out of it. It's looking at the probabilities of species being present in a monad in a given year. And that's what the sophisticated statistics attempts to do. Common Hawker, um, a fairly convincing declined certainly over the last 25 years and rather more so in England. But intriguingly, um, slightly disturbingly in my mind, 
it increased significantly in Scotland. Um, that deserves a bit of thought. Now I've picked out blue-tailed damselfly, which was one of those species uh, changing significantly in just one of the countries. So here in England, it went down by 7%. And actually for a number of years now, um, recorders have been saying, not seeing as many blue-tailed damselflies around as we usually do. And intriguingly, we have got this apparent decline over about the last 25, 30 years, gradual. And one thing I'm gonna highlight is that, that was the period when neonicotinoid insecticides were used fairly widely in Britain. And we do know from very nice evidence from the Netherlands, from experimental evidence, that neonics result in a reduced emergence in blue-tailed damselflies. Um, and although one with this sort of work can't link effect and cause, um, there is an interesting uh, correlation there, I think. We also, as I said earlier, had uh, a number of new kids on the block, which uh, changed life quite a bit um, for dragonfly watchers, at least in England and, and parts of Wales. Um, Scotland, I'm afraid you may have to wait a little bit longer before you see the benefits of some of those, perhaps. Although red veined darters and lesser emperors certainly made it, have made it um, at least occasionally up into Scotland and indeed the far north. Looking at our red list species, it was quite pleasing that we've seen increases in two of these, the scarce chaser, quite dramatically so in, in terms of spread of scarce chaser, and uh, maybe coming a little bit behind that Norfolk hawker. So these are two species that um, we now have to seriously think about changing the vernacular names of. So uh, blue hawker and dare I say it, pan green-eyed hawker um, may be in the offing. At the other end of the scale, uh, white-faced darter in England, we've heard a bit about white-faced darter already today, and we know we've lost sites in the southeast of England. Um, <laughs> no, Pam says no. Um, <laughs> we'll debate it. <laughs> we'll debate it, I'm sure, at some point. So somebody's saying that Jonathan's saying, would the blue-tailed damselflies be susceptible to neonics when other species have increased over the same period? Well, I'm interested because uh, blue tails are very tolerant. Um, they occur in, um, in brackish water um, and I believe also in polluted waters. I've seen them downstream of sewer outflows where certainly treated and maybe untreated sewage is coming out. So they're very tolerant and you find them in a lot of um, water courses, for example, in eastern England, around the fens where sugar beet um, was one of those crops, receiving quite a lot of neonic uh, treatment. Um, okay, the other two, the small damselflies, it will be interesting to see whether any of these actually benefit from a warmer climate, which one might expect them to do. Scarce blue-tailed um, may be able to move around a bit more where the small red can remains to be seen. Okay, so we weren't, of course, able to say from this analysis what caused these changes, but we can use our professional judgments and our amateur judgments, um, our knowledge of species ecology to try and suggest some likely causes. And one of the most obvious of these is climate change. So there's a graph that the Met Office produced of summer temperature anomalies. We know that our temperatures have increased on average by almost one degree during the summer, slightly less in winter. And that has produced larger um, and certainly more northerly climate envelopes for species. So these are the regions within which um, species can operate um, sustainably. Rising temperatures can also lead to faster larval development, both directly 
as a result of living in warmer water, but probably mainly through um, an increased ability to hunt and maybe larger numbers of prey items. And during the summer, adults undoubtedly survive better when the weather is good. Uh, rainfall seems to uh, cause, um, seems to result in, in much smaller numbers being around and um, hence um, poorer breeding and also less opportunity to be recorded by us folks. Um, we've also had record high temperatures and these exceptional plumes of air um, coming from the near continent, I'm sure have been instrumental in not only bringing new species across the channel to us, but also enabling species from southern England to move northwards and westwards too. We've also, of course, had an increased risk of drought, and we've heard about the possibilities for local extinctions of species like azure hawker, and um, also uh, maybe on the upside, reduced predation as a result of droughts, because droughts drying up waters uh, renders them fish-free and newt-free, both of which can um, predate dragonflies. So there are some uh, maybe pros and cons of those. Rainfall. Well, more rainfall, particularly in the summer, but also in the winter. Some of you got an awful lot of it last night. Thankfully, we in Devon managed to miss it. Didn't stop it being very windy, though. And we know that there's an increased incident of flooding. We've experienced that a lot in the last few decades. And this is known to um, enable the downstream spread of both larvae or perhaps eggs on plant material or just in the water itself. We know that there can also be mortality as species emerge and are subject to a spate, for example, club tails along a river um, during a heavy downpour, they may get washed off before they manage to fly away. But also from a habitat change angle, flooding can cause soil erosion. So the deposition of material from land and also moving around deposits within watercourses. It can also lead in pol to pollution, for example, from um, sewer uh, outflows that can't cope. And also at times of uh, high water when the sea levels are high and rainwater is coming downstream, then we can see the push of um, salt water inland, which kills off many invertebrates. So we have, in addition to these environmental changes, um, also seen a lot of wetland losses big scale and also more latterly creation and restoration. So for example, there was historic land drainage big time. We lost the fenlands, for example. We lost lots of ponds, particularly on farmland. And we lost bogs through um, maybe not very sensible afforestation in the past. We have on the upside though, created lots of ponds, lots of lakes, uh, not least through um, mineral extraction and subsequent flooding, uh, peat workings and flooded, and also the creation of larger waters like reservoirs for drinking water. We've seen some examples of wetland restoration on quite a big scale, I mentioned the mineral and peat workings being flooded, but sometimes quite large scale ones like below left the Avalon marshes in Somerset on the Somerset levels, um, and also in the Fenlands of East Anglia. And there on the right, some blanket bog restoration. So for example, in the flow country, some great work um, restoring the acidic bogs that once cl were clothed in these horrible conifers. So yeah, we've, we've um, regained some of those from forestry, 
and also from arable land. Water quality is obviously important for uh, a, an organism with aquatic larvae. And that comes from both urban discharges, and by that I include roads, many of which are rural as well. Um, but clearly we have probably seen the worst of um, industrial discharges. Many of those are perhaps better controlled now. Sewage, as we know from recent weeks, uh, we haven't quite got on top of yet. And there are many Victorian sewers that need sorting out and even the suds ponds that are being created uh, where there are new developments need connecting up properly so they take just rainwater and not sewage as is sometimes the case. Big scale, however, agricultural um, effects on water quality, given that about 90% of the UK is agricultural land and nearly all of that receives fertilizers, which can make the, uh, the water eutrophic, particularly nitrogen leaching from grasslands and arable, but also phosphorus coming through for fertilizers and of course from sewers as well, from sewage systems. Pesticides, I actually put a little bit further down the pecking order as it were of pollutants, um, partly because a lot of them are inactivated before they get to the mouths of dragonfly larvae. Um, locally, um, quite serious implications from silage and slurry tanks leaking, and particularly in uplands, but also um, grasslands more widely, burning management and grazing management have caused water quality issues. And finally, acidification. We've seen changes in the pH of waters due to afforestation and also uh, very widely through atmospheric deposition, acid rain. So in conclusion, our overall results do contrast with the declines that have been reported for several other species groups. There's been a preponderance of increases over decreases and these cover both generalists and new colonists, but also thankfully some of the red list species. So this um, maybe good news story is really likely to reflect changes in the climate, i.e. temperature and rainfall, but also the quantity and quality of our wetlands. In future, there will be a national focus from a dragonfly conservation group's point of view anyway, on emerald damselfly, black darter and common hawker. And of course, we won't neglect those special species in Scotland uh, that are um, boreal in, in nature. So I'm thinking of white-faced darter, northern damselfly, northern emerald, and azure uh, hawker too. So finally, thanks to everyone, um, many of you, in the audience today will have contributed towards that uh, data set. And um, please do remember that if you want more detail, it's available there on our website. Thank you.